I don't envy the difficult decisions that many of these great women and men who run the ports have to make right now, because how do I invest in things that will be obsolete in 10 or 20 years? If you are uh, doing things to generally decarbonize operations by electrifying the operations of your port, by installing the nearshore offshore wind farm or the solar panels, you're making very big bets with huge CapEx decisions about what your future is going to look like. Welcome to the Future Of, a podcast by Fresh Consulting, where we discuss and learn about the future of different industries, markets, and technology verticals. Together, we'll chat with leaders and experts in the field and discuss how we can shape the future human experience. I'm your host, Jeff Dance. This is the second in a two-part series focused on the future of ports, with a previous episode with three port leaders on the topic of port innovation. Today, we're talking about infrastructure, policy, and finance, and how that can both drive and constrain innovation. Kerry Davis is here with us. He's the president and CEO of the American Association of Port Authorities, known as AAPA. And AAPA is actually a 112-year-old thought leader and meeting place for over 120 Uh, Western Hemisphere seaports on international trade, infrastructure, shipping, security, supply chain, environmental stewardship, and digitalization. Um, Before serving as the president at AAPA, Kerry served in the federal government as a presidential appointee for international trade and security. He's also lectured at Penn, Georgetown, and the University of Denver, among others. Kerry, we're grateful to have you. Welcome. Jeff, thanks so much. Uh, I'm an admirer of you and of your company, Fresh Consulting. Uh, We've had the chance to work together. Uh, That is Fresh and AAPA, and I I value that relationship and appreciated your intro. It's It's a deep privilege and honor to help run with a great team at a 112-year-old uh, trade association for an industry that's pretty much as old as mankind, right? Trade and shipping. So uh, thank you for this opportunity. Awesome. Well, I, I admire uh, some of the original designers um, and architects, and they were shipbuilders. You know, they, uh, they in at Fresh, we both design things and engineer things, but some of the original designers and engineers were, you know, these amazing shipbuilders that were in your neck of the woods often. Um, so it's exciting, uh, and we're grateful for the partnership as well, and and the and looking forward to the future together. You know, um, seeing that you've already been covered in places like New York Times, Politico, BBC, Bloomberg, CNN, etc., and then to have you here, it's um, it's exciting. Um, just you know, before we really dive in, um, anything else you can tell the listeners about yourself, how your journey, and kind of um, becoming the president of AAPA, kind of what got you interested in the space. Um, love to hear a little bit more if you can. Okay, appreciate the opportunity to talk about that. I, I haven't had the most typical route when it comes to shipping and supply chain. I'm a trade lawyer. Uh, so I came up uh, as a young lawyer representing uh, global 500 companies, very large multinational conglomerates who were structuring deals, uh, selling widgets or uh, more f- financialization. Uh, I represented companies like Nike and Toyota. Um, I went into the government in the Department of Commerce to help work at a very high level with a lot of the, what you'd probably call updates to trade policy between the US and China. So this was during the eh, roller coaster and tumultuous Trump years. And he was completely shaking up the Washington consensus on sort of how we should approach China uh, and uh, and re- reshore a lot of our trade that we had offshore to China over the years. And so I was working on trying to ensure that U.S. companies and U.S. products were given the market access that we thought they ought to have. That is, it should be easier for us to sell to China, not just to buy from China. And uh, that was the, the launch pad to, well, let me just back up half a step. It's funny when you work in the government, especially in the federal government, these really high level, like we should export this much more lumber to China or Vietnam or Canada. And you never really think, how does that lumber get from point A to point B? What are the means of actually moving it? 
And that's why I was so glad to actually now work a little bit more on the hands-on aspects of supply chains, not just theoretical numbers about how much we can or should sell, but okay, you, you make a deal to buy and sell between countries. Well, how does the how does the stuff get from point A to point B? And I'm fortunate to get to work on that stuff now. Nice. Thank you. Um, you're involved in uh, a lot of you know serious conversations uh, when it comes to to policy, trade, and and the future. And you know this is between cities and countries and and government organizations. What do you do for fun? How do you how do you how do you kind of balance in the fun? Uh, the things that matter most to me are pretty much two in this order: family and golf. Uh, but but anytime I'm not working or golfing or reading, uh, I'm I'm with family. Uh, the the older and more experienced I get, the more I realize we are nothing but dust and atoms without people uh, that we can share our experiences with. And for me, there's no one better than than family. Uh, so I love my family. And a close second is golf. I'm uh, fortunate to do a lot of road tripping and travel to go see great golf courses. Uh, I'm part of these um, virtual networks where you can meet people at different clubs and at different locations. So I've made some incredible uh, friends and contacts and seen some of the most beautifully conceived and manicured golf courses uh, in the world. I was just at Lookout Mountain above Georgia, uh, above Chattanooga, if anyone knows that location. But yes, there is about a 115-year-old golf course on top of that mountain. And it's uh, it was a religious experience, actually. So those are the things I love. Awesome. That sounds fun. Thank you. Well, you've, uh, you know, you've said public policy advocacy is the, the sharp edge of the knife for why the AAPA exists on behalf of uh, U.S. seaport members. Can you talk more about the AAPA's role in, in port policy today and, and some of its recent impacts? Definitely, Jeff. Let me back up half a step. You, you correctly said that AAPA, based in Washington, D.C., represents United States seaports vis-a-vis -vis the federal government. So whether it's the president, uh, him or herself, uh, the National Economic Council, the Department of Transport, the United States Congress, including all of the appropriations committees, which hold the purse strings for everything the federal government spends money on. Uh, we represent United States ports vis-a-vis -vis all of those decision makers. Our trade association, so there are about 80 of those deep draft ports in the U.S., deep draft being 30, 40 feet of depth. Uh, there are another 40 plus seaports from Canada, Latin America, uh, the Caribbean and the Pacific Islands that are also members of our trade association. We have events, networking, best practices, publications. We talk a lot about technology and how that's taking root in the industry. Um, so, so that's kind of the makeup of our trade association. Uh, 125 ish ports across the entire hemisphere, 80 some odd ports in the U.S. And yes, we lobby for them. We try to ensure that the federal government is paying requisite attention and resources to these hubs of transportation that are so important for our national economy. The things that move, uh, not a shocker, but I have to say it, the things that move through ports touch every single congressional district in the country. So we go into congresswomen and congressmen's office to let them know, hey, uh, yes, you might be from Iowa, but do you know where your corn and soy products, do you, do you know the probably 15 plus coastal ports that all of those commodities are moving through? So uh, there are uh, myriad funding mechanisms through the government uh, for port infrastructure. This is, uh, you, you asked, what are some of the recent impacts? Well, the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act, which were two landmark pieces of legislation in the last three years, uh, really stepped up the, the funding levels that are available for port infrastructure. And I always applaud our congresswomen and men for stepping up to that challenge. Ho hopefully we'll have sustainable funding, but the recent infusions have been historic. I mean, even even way beyond what happened in the Eisenhower era when we were building the uh, national highway system. We're, we're, we're talking historic levels of funding. And day in and day out, there's just environmental regulations, uh, supply chain resilience. Um, I, I often joke that 112 years ago when AEPA was first formed, there were no building standards for docks and fires were breaking out left and right. Well, guess what? 
with the increase in EVs that are being shipped through ports and these lithium ion batteries, we're seeing a new era of fires on the ships and the docks. So some of the things, you know, it's back to the future. Some of the things don't change. So that's an issue we work on as an industry. But I think we're going to probably get into some digitization, digitalization, automation, tech. So some of the issues are way different than what we were talking about 112 years ago. Thank you. Can you give an overview of the the power program? We've been reading about that port port opportunities with energy resilience and sustainability and kind of how that affects individual ports. Is that part of the infrastructure uh, movement or tell us more? Well, absolutely. Let, let me just pick up specifically on what you asked, and then I'll zoom out and talk about the program a little more generally, whether it's the offshore wind build out, right? At our national goal to get to 30 gigs of offshore wind generated energy by 2030, or it's the uh, some of your recent thought leaders that you had about port technology were talking about uh, how it might make a lot of sense to do solar farms because of all of the relatively flat warehousing space that um, and assets that are at a lot of these port complexes. It kind of makes a lot of sense to do solar on top of those. Um, there are ports working on micro nuclear. There are micro nuclear manufacturing and enrichment facilities that are being co-located at ports. So I'm just giving you a sense, right? Some of the cool, sexy things, but ultimately ports are huge movers and users of energy, right? We're, whether we're moving traditional oil and gas products to the ports or moving to alternative fuels, uh, LNG, hydrogen, hydrogen hubs are now being co-located at ports. There's And the ports themselves and their operations require a lot of energy, as do the giant vessels that are called, you know, going in between the ports. So as users and movers of energy, it only makes sense to co-locate a lot of the frankly, next generation of energy uh, production, uh, uh, the, the sources I mentioned, offshore wind directly, you know, that that's the one that's like uh, ramping up the fastest. We knew that as an industry, we need to be makers of policy and decisions in these topics rather than takers, which was the historical role that we were playing. It was just kind of like whatever the vessel builders, the people who build the big ships, they were making decisions over in Europe about the energy sources that are going to power the ships. The legacy utilities and the energy producers, they were making decisions. Ports, as the hubs of where a lot of this happening, we're trying to up our game and be makers of decisions as well. So that's what the port opportunities with energy resilience and sustainability program is all about. Of course, we are moving towards decarbonization in a realistic manner. And we're not just throwing out, some ports have, right? Every port is different. If you've seen one port, you've seen one port. Some ports have made commitments about timelines that they're going get, to get to net zero. Most haven't. We as an industry have not, but we certainly play in the large international debates about what the realistic timelines for decarbonization are. It's really interesting. Um, and it goes along with, you know, what we heard you say I mean, previously that this this is an infrastructure decade. And so it sounds like we have the funding and now a lot of the ideas and the programs to help modernize the front doors of our country. Um, as far as, you know, in, a, in, a, in initiatives that you think ports should be investing in today, you mentioned, you know, decarbonization. Um, you talked about um, solar as a, as a key theme in some of the big uh, wind energy programs that are being rolled out. And and more. Um, what what else do you think ports should be investing in today? I know each port is unique, um, but are there you know I, I, beyond what you just mentioned? Are there some key themes of things that really need to be modernized as we think about preparing for the future? It's a fantastic question, Jeff. And as you survey the industry on uh, what they're investing in, it it runs a wide gamut. I think I'd be kidding myself and your listeners, if I didn't start by saying we had so much deferred maintenance and upkeep of just what you might call the brick and mortar of ports. Uh, and a lot of the, I mentioned the infusion, the historical dollars through the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act, a lot of the early tranches of those funds starting around calendar year 21 and ongoing were for rehabilitating 
traditional port infrastructure, which was just nearing the end of its useful life. I, I talked about sort of the, the Eisenhower infrastructure program post-World War II. That's when a lot of modern ports were built. So you can imagine those tarmacs, those wharves, those docks, um, those warehouses, those access roads, right? You can imagine it was all reaching the end of its useful life. One of my favorite stories comes from Port Angeles, Washington, probably not very far from you. They had a pier, uh, which was 115 years old. So it was older than AAPA itself. And they fortunately got a couple million dollars. It was a sizable, I couldn't cite exactly how much their federal grant was to rehabilitate that pier, but just gives you a sense of the, def the, the, the deferred investment. Now we're moving. So we, we've covered a lot of those types of getting the uh, traditional uh, infrastructure back up to snuff. One thing that we've always got to do as an industry and as a nation, as an economy, is ensure that the largest vessels, the largest ships, the most modern ships are able to call on U.S. ports. That includes cruising and tourism ships, by the way, a major economic driver and um, lifeblood to so many communities all across the country uh, because, of course, it, it tends to be people with disposable income, uh, uh, a, little, a little wealthier clientele, although cruising is very democratic and really works for a lot of different um, people. It's a great economic driver. So whether it's the largest cruise ships or more commonly the largest cargo ships, they have a very deep draft that, that they need in order to call on ports. So the dredging program at ports, uh, which is a huge thing that the U.S. federal government for um, for uh, many, many years has really taken a leadership role on, dredging is constantly Im important because uh, by by God's choice, uh, silting is natural, right? The, the channels where these ships go and the areas where they dock are always experiencing silting. So dredging is, is a never ending, is a never ending uh, aspect of uh, in, quote unquote infrastructure maintenance at ports. We've learned uh, through a survey that there are $50 billion of alternative energy fraud projects in some stage at ports. Granted, a lot of these are on the planning or the conceptual stage, but I did mention everything from hydrogen to nuclear to offshore wind. So there are plenty of projects that actually have shovels in the ground as well, but $50 billion of green energy projects. And as part of that, and I apologize for going long here, but you can tell I'm excited about it. And there's so many funding opportunities and there's so many different types of projects. It's an exciting time. The, the last big thing to look out for is the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, in the federal government is rolling out a one-time tranche, a one-time bite at the apple, $3 billion grant program for cleaner port infrastructure and operations. That's going to be rolling out in either Q1 or Q2 of, of this year, of 2024. So we're, we're, we helped write this program with the government. We're helped writing the parameter, you know, the, all the details. It's a, you know, you, you can imagine how long the list of parameters are for a project to qualify for something like this. So we're, we're working with the government on that. And that funding window is going to open probably late Q1 24. We saw such extreme pain, you know, during the pandemic with, with this supply chain. We all felt it, you know, and, uh, even Santa with his, his uh, elf Amazon really struggled. You know, uh, we all struggled uh, during that time. Do you think that, you know, and sometimes you need some deep problems to kind of bring people's into the light of innovation needs and whether that's dredging and that's the real innovation that, that a port needs to, you know, these, uh, these micronuclear uh, energy plants or the, the solar of the future. Um, do you think that has shaped the, you know, the policy and, and the funding that we're seeing now to, to drive innovation? In many ways, yes. Although I'd be kidding myself if I said we've really internalized all the lessons of the pandemic supply chain crunch. Now, I, being a good lawyer and lobbyist for my industry, I have to say not a single port closed for a single day because of the challenges of the pandemic. That in and of itself, I think, shows that we were pretty resilient. And that was in stark contrast with what was happening 
with ports around the world, including in China and certain large gateways in Africa, where the public health emergency actually closed down the critical infrastructure, including ports. So I actually thought we did pretty good there. Yeah, one of the things you cited was that you know many shippers were essentially using sp- uh, the port space as sort of free warehousing, you know, during the during that pandemic for various reasons. And I, I, I'm just curious on your angle on that. Do you, was that a main um, part of the the bottleneck that that uh, you know things were just kind of stale? I, I do believe it was. I am not here to blast all of the amazing shippers and brands and companies that use our ports. Uh, far from it. We want operations to be fluid. We want them to be able to have visibility into their cargo location and to be able to get the cargo as they see fit. Was it like the biggest contributing factor? No, consumption spike was the biggest contributing factor, but it was the least reported factor, I believe. And you pretty much cited my own words back to me, but because of uh, it was it was a, a backflow of cargo because put, put yourself back in, you know, mid 2020 economies still shut down in many ways, but uh, or traditional economy, brick and mortar, uh, in person economy, if you will, still shut down in many ways. And yet the, you know, online buying spree is like nothing we we've seen before. I think we, you know, mo- most most. Um, Expert economists would say something like, we fast forwarded our buying habits by about 10 years, right? So we, we were shifting towards e-commerce, but we, we, in the course of one year, we like lurched 10 years forward. So because brick and mortar was closed, because inventories were full or being strained, at one point there was like 0.1% warehousing capacity available in Southern California. It, it was, it was, uh, Packed to the gills, a lot of cargo owners were leaving their cargo on the docks for lack of being able to put it somewhere else, and that was uh, that that was causing uh, a lack of space, basically. So I do think that was the mo- the most underreported thing. I take a lot of heart now, though, for a lot of reasons, not the least of which are uh, well, three. One is what we were talking about before. A lot of the infrastructure investments are increasing the capacity of ports, you can move stuff more quickly, Um, more comfortably when ports were moving nearly 20% more cargo at the height of the buying spree. um, People forget that too, right? We were were moving more stuff. Uh, Capacity improvements through infrastructure investments help a lot. Two, uh, I don't want to, I want this uh, conversation to be evergreen, but you, you, you folks will know there is a crisis playing out in the Red Sea right now with the Houthi, Houthi militants attacking the large cargo ships and many of those car- cargo carriers, the vessel operators saying, saying we're not even going to do business in the Red Sea right now. The government and industry have been getting together regularly to try to anticipate what's the impact going to be. How is cargo going to start shifting from one region to the next? Do we need to deploy more truckers? longshore folks, um, chassis to be better prepared where there might be a surge of cargo. So we're having regular calls along those lines. And that feeds up into point three, which is the government has recently stood up its flow initiative, Freight Logistics Optimization Works. It is a, um, it, it is a, ultimately at the end of the day, it's an algorithm and a metric to help predict where surge, uh, where and when cargo surge periods are going to go so that we can be better prepared for it. See around the proverbial corner, you know, what, 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 might, the tre- what might the flow trend be um, in 10 days, in 20 days, in three months? Uh, so we're, we're better prepared and so that we can continue better coordinating from the vessel to the terminal operator, to the port authority, to the longshore, to the trucker, to the rail, to the carrier, uh, to the cargo owner. You know, all these links in the chain, if you will, uh, are better able to coordinate if we're all looking at the same data set. Awesome. It's good to hear, you know, about the infrastructure and the programs to alleviate what we all experienced, you know, ac- across the world. And it's good to get some insights on, on why that happened. Uh, one of the things you just touched on was, um, you know, the Red Sea. And and that brings us to security, you know, being a big part of port infrastructure. Um, we're seeing... Ports now, though, like like the ones connected to Israel and 
you know, the ones connected to, you know, Russia and Ukraine as like these war zones. Um, and so I think that kind of heightens our, our thinking around security. Uh, so can, can you talk a little bit more about how, um, you know, wh- how, how you guys are thinking about security? I know there's a bill recently introduced. Um, what, 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 what initiatives are important right now as, a, as we think about security? Well, I want to pick up on the one nugget that you dropped there again before zooming out, because this is an important uh, specific point. This is the uh, CBP Space Act, which is what you just referred to, or Securing Ports at Customs Expense, CBP Space Act. Coming from the world of politics, uh, I've always liked writing bill acronyms. So that that's one of my... One of my cornier ones. The flow is amazing, by the way. I really get behind flow. So that, that that's the creative side of you guys uh, coming out. <laughs> I can't take credit for that one. There was a um, a, a couple uh, really good federal officials uh, who I work with who came up with that one. So I, I can't take for that one. I, w- I wish I could. But I, I really do like writing bill names, especially when they kind of capture the uh, challenge you're trying to solve or the thing we can all get rally around. So... What we're proposing, the specifics of the bill are uh, specific. There are certain revenues, fees, funding streams that all of this activity at ports generates, right? The activity at ports generates a lot of money that go back into the public treasury that, yes, should be reinvested in ports, but also go to pay for all the services that we rely on uh, government help and support for. So I would argue that the activity at ports um, is really helping our federal budget overall and, and state budgets for that matter. Uh, to that point, it has always, always, going back to the beginning of the U.S. Constitution, it's actually in there. It has always been the responsibility of the government to help oversee the security of the ports. That's not to say the port authorities and all of the users of the ports don't have responsibility, but the presence of Customs and Border Protection, CBP, a unit of the Department of Homeland Security, it's always been the federal government's responsibility to pay for their presence and for their operations at ports to facilitate the flow of cargo. So what we're proposing to do with the CBP Space Act is to adjust some of those merchandise fees to ensure that the agency, CBP, does in fact have the funds that they need to, guess what, recapitalize a lot of their infrastructure that has that is reaching the end of its useful life, whether it's their um, the warehouses where they do the inspections or as we move more towards um, a, a digital system, they use very sophisticated uh, IT architecture and algorithms, including AI, to determine what are the highest risk cargoes that, hey, we should open up that box and take a look at what's in there because it might be coming from a high risk country or something like that. So that, that's what we propose to do with that bill. Uh, appreciate the chance to kind of plug it. We would love to see its passage in 2024. And of all the things that Congress fights on, they can't even agree on the color of the sky or the day of the week. This is a bipartisan bill that everyone agrees on, right? Getting our agents the resources that they needed facilitating commerce. I kind of want to start zooming out on the point I started making about uh, the digitization of more port operations and the threat that that carries with it. Look, the, 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 the physical infrastructure, the hard infrastructure of ports is always going to be a high value, juicy target for anyone who wants to disrupt economic operation, right? Whether it's economic warfare or you want to um, make it more difficult to get in and out of a country. Maybe you want to scare off the trading partners from doing business in that country, right? So Full infrastructure is always going to be a threat. Again, huge kudos to the government. They've done a great job, especially post 9-11, whether through regulations or through funding to help the ports uh, remain safe. And now we're entering an operation where more of the, we're entering an era when more of the port operations are connected, IOT, um, the operating systems of the ports being critical for the, for the day-to-day operations and success. So there are, of course, many new threat vectors that any bad actor is going to be looking at, right? Can I, you know, this, this is not a secret. There are, if you Google this, you'll read about U.S. ports and foreign ports that have been uh, victims of ransomware attacks. Hey, we're going to shut down your port. We're going to impose a million dollars plus of ec- economic losses. That's what we estimate the closure of a port for one day to be. That adds up pretty quick, doesn't it, right? Hey, we're going to take your equipment offline. We're going to... Um, 
hold your uh, customer data set, uh, databases, ransom, a lot of, lot of new threat vectors where you could uh, target it for. Thank you. You know, as we think about the future, you, you want to learn from the past and you've cited some things from the past. You, you want to be present in the present and, and understand really the challenges and you want, to, you want to prepare for the future. And it's good to hear that, you know, you're thinking about both sides of making the future good. Um, it's not just innovation, but it's also security. And it's kind of, it's not just being open, but it's also being um, safe. Um, and, you know, having that balance, I think, is, is so important. As we think about the future and jump ahead, you know, 10 to 20 years, I know you talked about the AAPA being a 112-year organization. So 10 to 20 years ahead may not seem as, as big of a time, but in technology, it's a very long time. You know, yeah. it's like you can have something like AI come in and be, you know, something akin to fire, the invention of fire, you know, and like what that might do for humanity, you know, and so, um, so it's a it's a very long time. As as we think about the future, you mentioned you know digitization, IoT. You mentioned core infrastructure. When you when you change core infrastructure, that can last for a long time and be you know beneficial for a long time. But what you know what as you look ahead, being in the position you are, where you see the the dollars coming in for this infrastructure, um, you know what what port policy or or you know infrastructure um, changes. You know, what things we, should we look forward to or what things do you envision as we kind of look to the future? Jeff, it is a lot of the things we've been talking about. Uh, let me sort of start with a, a quandary before giving some specific ideas about what a port, what a, what a U.S. or hemispheric port might look like in 10 or 20 years. And that I don't envy the difficult decisions that many of these great women and men who run the ports have to make right now because... They're trying to decide, okay, historic federal uh, and states. Now, now because the, the feds are making such large investments in the ports, we see a lot of the large, especially maritime trading states. You can imagine that it's the Floridas, the Louisianas, and, but, and California, and plenty of others. Um, they're, they're now saying, okay, our dollars can go further, right? So we're now creating dedicated funding streams for our ports to better match the opportunities that are available at the federal level. And the women and men who run these ports have to decide, okay, is I'm going to gear up and get my grant writers together and spend my political capital trying to work with policymakers to maybe get an absolute game-changing grant to reimagine the infrastructure of my port. How do I invest in things that won't be obsolete in 10 or 20 years, right? Uh, what what are the types of cranes, uh, trucks, um, warehousing? Uh, what is the depth that my channel needs to be to accommodate ships that aren't going to hit the water for four or five years? It's a three, you know, give or take a three year lead time to build a world class cargo ship, and some of them are being built that are going to be fueled by methanol. Some of them are being built that are going to be uh, fueled by ammonia. Some of them are being built that are going to be fueled by hydrogen. Some of them are going to be able, you're going to be able to toggle back and forth between uh, different fuel types. So as you're deciding what type of project you want to uh, uh, angle for funding for, and you're trying to decide, well, if I'm going to offer these fuel types at my port and I have to build pipelines and fueling facilities and, and barges that are going to deliver the fuel to the ships. What's the fuel of the future? What am I betting on? Right. So I don't envy a lot of, uh, and that's just one example. If you're, if you're uh, uh, installing a new operating system and IT architecture at your port, if you are uh, doing things to generally decarbonize operations by electrifying the operations of your port, by installing the the uh, near near shore offshore wind farm or the solar panels, you're making very big bets with huge cap X decisions about what your future is going to look like. And, and it's dip from where I sit, you know, to kind of zoom out and, and uh, not belabor this, but try to answer your question a little more generally. The infrastructure of the ports is going to include a lot of the things we're talking about. Electrified operations, more connected and automated equipment. Uh, I, I use a term that I don't hear all that often, which is cobots. It's amazing how much more safe and comfortable we can make the lives of port workers and of longshore folks uh, by use of 
machines that are going to make their lives better. I, I think, you know, imagine if we were still in an era where we were using uh, grappling hooks to take bales of name your commodity, uh, wheat, sorghum, whatever, um, off, off of a ship. I mean, we had, you know, circa only 50 years ago, there were more than 4,000 casualties of women and men working at our ports. And that's down to a handful. Uh, everyone's a tragedy, of course. But so so it's kind of it, it, I don't think it's that dissimilar. Like no one would argue that we should go back to the era of grappling hooks um, and, and getting a level of uh, comfort and education about uh, these innovations is is really important for the trade association and for the technologists that are going to help the ports uh, uh, envision what 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 they're going to look like 10, 20 years from now. Thank you. There's definitely a heightened awareness of the dirty, dull, and dangerous jobs. You know that ro the robotics and and, and uh, automation can can help solve for the future, where you have often less labor, uh, less people like interested in that work, um, and then uh, injuries, and also a, a changing workforce that's used to used used to having more maybe more digital tools or you know more more connected uh, infrastructure. So you mentioned cobots, and uh, you also mentioned kind of IoT from a technology perspective. We talked about the, some of the different energies. Um, can you think of any other technologies that what might p play a big part in in the future? You know, we we talked about the more open we are, kind of the, the more secure we have to be because that represents a, a threat as well. So that's not something to take lightly. Um, but do, do any other technologies come to come and come to mind that might shape the future? Absolutely, Jeff. The big one is digital platforms where cargo data is shareable on an interoperable basis across the players in the supply chain. So a lot of jargon there. Most of your listeners will have some sense of what I'm talking about. But these are, you know, the, these are the, 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 the Ubers of freight or so, some people cheekily uh, refer to the to the pizza test of freight where you can apparently track your dominoes uh, all through on the process. They did never actually use that app. But there's uh, I, I believe deeply, I believe deeply in um, getting young women and men to get more interested in our industry and frankly, to get a lot of the perspectives of of younger folks. So I run a really robust law clerk and intern program through the trade association where I'm mostly bringing in young folks from the colleges and universities in Washington, D.C. To, to come work for us for a semester or longer if they choose. And um, <laughs> uh, when we really started ramping up our work on working amongst the ports and the government and other players in maritime transport to think about uh, the the what a really good interoperable digital system for freight looks like. I had a, a young man say, "What do you mean we're going to do that?" And I was like, "Well, you know, customers of shipping they they want a better sense of where their cargo is. They they want to be able to track it. Um, we can drive so many more efficiencies in the system if the the truckers and and the rail operators and the and the and the uh, the ports." all kind of have a single source of truth about when the ship is arriving and how quickly it'll unload. And he just couldn't wrap his head around that we didn't already have something like this, right? He's a native, you know, he's a native to apps that I can't even imagine give you insights into everything. I've started doing some mood tracking, which is pretty helpful, but are natives to, to things I don't even understand. And he just couldn't imagine that in a such, such a high stakes industry that accounts in some way, shape, or form for one quarter of our GDP that we didn't have something like this. So a lot of ports have their own what are called port community systems, PCS. There are other terms, but th these are generally what we call these digital platforms for car cargo tracking. And some of them are amazing, but a lot of them just don't speak to each other, right? And it's it's really remarkable from one port to the next, from one shipping company to the next, the way we define arrival, when does the ship arrive at the port? When it comes into the harbor, when it ties up dockside, when the cargo gets cleared and it's allowed to begin moving off the ship. Everyone defines this differently. How in the world can you have a, a commonality of terms of data, um, of decision making? When, when, you when you don't have standard definition. So that work is heavily underway. I mentioned the flow initiative. That's, that, that's being led by the government. And that specifically 
purpose of figuring out where bottlenecks and surges might occur. But of course, we want to be able to do so many more things, uh, include put AI over the top of these platforms. So that is, you know, one of the most exciting things happening over the next 20, 10, 20 years. And I would hope that we have a really powerful, useful, trustworthy, um, interoperable national system, and maybe even an international system before 20 years. Nice. That, that sounds foundational. You know, the, the digitization movement is, is something that goes in waves, you know, through, through different industries. Um, and, it, and it is foundational, I think, to getting into higher orders of, you know, automation or robotics or AI. You know, you got to have the data and you got to have an exchange and that, that connectivity is, is sort of the, you know, the foundation. So it sounds like that's still rolling through, you know, the ports. Um, being being ones that have had had a lot of legacy infrastructure, and so and a lot of high, because of the heightened security about um, all that interchange, I, I could see where they might be um, a little reticent to just dive in as they're as they're weighing. Hey, this this is a this is a big part of of the future, and am I on the am I on the right stack, or am I connected into the right um, programs, and do I have the right security in place? But um, with the funding, with the standards. Um, with the uh, with the interest, it seems like that is um, I can see how that's a that's a big part of the future and almost necessary in order to get into the kind of the higher orders of uh, automation or, or technology innovation that can really shape the future. But I love the analogy of the you know the Uber freight as we think about or the Domino's pizza tracker as we think about you know how do you keep flow flowing um, and have a, have a system that that everyone can kind of tie into. Um, there's a there's a framework called uh, the DIKW framework and it's data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. And I, as I'm hearing you, I'm thinking of that. And it's it it it's you know it seems like oh you need the data in order to have the connectivity, in order to have the flow or the exchange, in order to kind of get into these higher orders of of automation. So thank you for kind of sharing uh, that vision. Um, and you know what's what's going to be happening, and and how you think about how AAPA continues to drive and support that. Um, as you think about AAPA's role in designing the future, um, you know how would you describe that? You're you're obviously at the the front of driving critical funding, and there's billions you know at stake for for creating the future. But how do you think about AAPA's role in in creating the future for ports? It takes three forms. I appreciate your asking because building consensus in an industry trade association with as big of a footprint as us is tough when you have different ports being run by different personalities and business leaders with a vision of what their port can and should be it is they're moving different cargoes for different types of customers um it is hard to build consensus uh among such a far-flung industry we try to do it in a few different ways one is we listen to our members we have so many different uh, forums where ports and our supply chain partners get together to talk about the latest and greatest in our industry, whether it's a security committee, an IT committee, an economic development committee, a legislation and policy committee. You get the idea. I could keep going. Defense. You get the idea. We have uh, people who are really dedicated to their craft, who know the industry well and its needs and can bring their individual and parochial views about what their ports are doing. And we get together in the setting of committees, events, and the like to try to find areas of commonality. As you've probably heard, that's, that's the one big way that we do it from just a, a nuts and bolts of how a trade association works. Um, and we're, we're cautious and careful not to push for policies that would, uh, to use a football analogy, outkick our coverage. We always want to remain um, within the, 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 the defensive coverage of what our ports want to undertake as a collective. And to that point, we do also push, um, sometimes try to push the envelope as a trade association on especially the collective action issues that no one port itself can do. And that's that's kind of goes back 112 years to the to the building standards for fire. You know, every, every port is probably going to have a little bit of a different notion about what that best building standard is 
or what the best uh, standard is given their geography, given the, the salinity of the water, given how many EVs they're moving. They each might have a, a different notion about what the best standard is. So, so we will try to proactively push some ideas about um, what, what, what might help the industry as a whole. So the, the, the two main thrusts are uh, trying to find common denominators about what our industry cares about and what's their association to work on, and also a little more proactively trying to find the, the sticky wicket areas where it kind of takes um, a UN of sorts uh, to, to uh, push um, topics that'll benefit everyone. We, we do, uh, and we will be doing more and more white papers of this sort that kind of compare um, what is the overall national jobs and economic impact of our industry to, again, better position us as getting the attention and resources that we need from policymakers. We'll be doing a paper a little further out that compares how other countries devote resources to their ports and, in fact, to their digital architecture and what the U.S. can learn from that. That's the type of project that only the National Trade Association or International Trade Association can do. So those are some of the ways that we try to build consensus. Great. It's really interesting, you know, comparing obviously to, to other countries, you know, and and seems like our, our airports are finally getting a bit more attention in the U.S., whereas they've been, you know, we're uh, one of the most uh, innovative countries, and yet we have some of the worst airports. And, and you know, seeing that kind of innovate finally uh, across the board slowly. But I could see where, you know, watching other countries and saying, well, what are we doing better and what are others doing better uh, kind of can can raise some attention. Um, thank yep, you for yep, sharing yep. Um, the AAPA's uh, role and kind of shaping the future and how you're really at the intersection of, you know, so many voices, so many challenges and so many opportunities. It sounds like a um, a job that probably has its highest highs and and its and, and some lows as well. Um, it sounds like a roller coaster, but one that you know you can feel your energy and your 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 passion for this space and your insights have been um, really rewarding. Um, I, I, before we wrap up, you know, a couple of questions I'd like to ask, um, and and just to see if you have any insights. You know, technology has a life of its own. Um, often. It's it's moving at a pace that humans don't really you know quite catch up and and we think about humanity uh, in in the middle of all this and when you're at the center of so many dollars and sort of you know planning for the future architecting the future and designing the future um, I always ask you know how do you do that with intent how do you consider uh, the humans in the equation and the people in the equation versus just the dollars or the commerce. Um, and do you have any thoughts uh, from that nature? Because there's a thing about policy, sometimes we forget uh, humanity uh, and we forget, and then we find out that technology doesn't serve us sometimes. Um, so so any any reflection that or any thoughts that come to mind related to how we design the future with intent? That is a heavy philosophical question that, I, that I'm not qualified to answer, but I do go back to some of, some of my roots which is federal politics and public policy. And I kind of, I started most of our conversation talking about how, you know, in our marble buildings in Washington, and trust me, AAPA is not in one of those marble buildings, but in our marble buildings of Washington, the brain trusts of the decision makers think they know exactly how much of this commodity or that commodity we should be selling to a foreign country. And we never think about, well, how does that actually get executed? You know, who, who moves those things? I started this combo talking about that a little bit. I've been very heartened in recent weeks to meet with uh, some of the greatest companies, not just in the US, but in the world, who are designing a lot of the AI architecture. And because uh, most especially in the context recently of a, a, a presidential executive order on the use of AI in public policy, you can, you can go read it. It's a President Biden um, executive order. I'm, I'm still wrapping my head around it. Some of the large, uh, it specifically mentions the transportation sector, and it specifically mentions that the United States Department of Transportation will need a plan for incorporating AI into its policymaking and for regulating the use of AI in uh, the transportation modalities. And I was just so impressed by, uh, I, I, they'll re re remain nameless for now, but a lot of these tech companies, if you will, uh, brought me up to get a sense of, well, what are the potential uses of AI in the transportation sector? Um, 
Frankly, they ask me questions just like you did, which is, you know, what's the real world impact on human beings? Uh, can they use this? Will they want to use this? Will they understand it? Will they shy away from it? Will they be harmed by it? Um, so I'm certain that so many of these conversations are happening. We all chuckled or worse a few years ago when Congress was holding various hearings on some of the social media platforms. And it didn't really seem like a lot of me some members of Congress are brilliant politicians and communicators when it when it comes to social media. But let's face it, many of them are not. And we all, you know, just kind of face palmed and we're like, really, these these decisions about our society, you, you've got to understand it. You've got to wrestle with it. The word the, the the scuttlebutt that I'm hearing is that a lot of the AI briefings classified and otherwise that are happening in Congress right now are being very productive. We understand there's an impact on humans and our fellow citizens on the way we live, work and value ourselves on the arms race that it creates with many people who would use AI for bad, for evil. I think you've asked a heady question. I don't know the answer to it, but I think smart people are working on it. And that gives me a lot of hope. I think that's a fair answer. And I would agree with you. And I think the the notion of data and being open, but balancing that with being secure and thinking about the impact to the everyday person and, and how it transforms us as human beings is, is, a, is a big one. So get, getting uh, more than one perspective, I think, is a lot of us are students right now of, of the near-term future that is heavily weighing on us and fast, fastly moving. Um, Kerry, really appreciate you being on the show. Um, any other thoughts before we wrap up on the future or AAPA? I'm just grateful for this opportunity. You can, of course, follow us on socials at Ports United. Uh, that's going to give you like updates on how the U.S. government is thinking about ports, maritime supply chain, and how the ports are positioning themselves there. I understand you're an excellent snowboarder, so I wish you happy shredding this winter. Um, oh, uh, Fresh Consulting has had a great relationship with AAPA so far. I'm learning a lot from you all. I think our ports are learning a lot from you all. It's a super exciting time for the recapitalization and reimagination of what ports are like, why supply chains are so important. I think my very last, I've talked to your ear also, I've been gracious for, for your chance. I think the last thought I would leave you and your listeners with um, in an era of great disruption and energy transition and the great energy addition where we're using so many more different fuel sources is maritime shipping is currently the cleanest, greenest, most efficient way to move anything, full stop. So we're doing other things to be better environmental stewards, but maritime shipping is by definition the cleanest, greenest, most efficient way to move anything. So that's something I'm really proud about. Thanks for your leadership and uh, also your your insights and your, your wisdom uh, today. We're excited to see you shape the future. Thanks, Kerry. Thank you, Jeff. The Future of Podcast is brought to you by Fresh Consulting. To find out more about how we pair design and technology together to shape the future, visit us at freshconsulting.com. Make sure to search for The Future of an Apple Podcast, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Make sure to click subscribe so you don't miss any of our future episodes. And on behalf of our team here at Fresh, thank you for listening.